my God, to whom all hearts are open and all desires known, and from whom no secrets are hid, cleanse the thoughts of our hearts by the inspiration of your Holy Spirit, that we may perfectly love you and worthily magnify your holy name, through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Amen. If we say we have no sin, we deceive ourselves, and the truth is not in us. But if we confess our sins, God, who is faithful and just, will forgive our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Most merciful God, we confess that we are by nature sinful and unclean, and have sinned against you in thought, word, and deed. By what we have done, and by what we have left undone, we have not loved you with our whole heart. We have not loved our neighbors as ourselves. For the sake of your Son, Jesus Christ, have mercy on us. Forgive us, renew us, and lead us, so that we may delight in your will. Almighty God, in his mercy, has given his Son to die for us, and for his sake forgives us all of our sins. As a call and ordained minister of the Church of Christ and by his authority, I therefore declare to you who do truly repent and believe in Jesus Christ the entire forgiveness of all your sins in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. The peace of the Lord be with you always. And also with you. <laughs> the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the communion of the Holy Spirit be with you all. And also with you. And let us pray. Eternal God, your kingdom has broken into our troubled world through the life, death, and resurrection of your Son. Help us to hear your word and obey it, so that we become instruments of your redeeming love. Through your Son, Jesus Christ our Lord, who lives and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. A reading from Exodus. God spoke all these words. I am the Lord your God, who brought you out of the land of Egypt, out of the house of slavery. You shall have no other gods before me. You shall not make for yourself an idol, whether in the form of anything that is in heaven above, or that is on earth beneath or that is in the water beneath the earth. You shall not bow down to them or worship them, for I, the Lord your God, am a jealous God, punishing children for the iniquity of parents to the third and fourth generation of those who reject me, but showing steadfast love to the thousandth generation of those who love me and keep my commandments. You shall not make wrongful use of the name of the Lord your God, for the Lord will not acquit anyone who misuses his name. Remember the Sabbath day and keep it holy. Six days you shall labor and do all your work, but the seventh day is a Sabbath to the Lord your God. You shall not do any work, you, your son or your daughter, your male or female slave, your livestock or the alien resident in your towns. For in six days the Lord made heaven and earth, the sea and all that is in them, but rested the seventh day. Therefore the Lord blessed the Sabbath and consecrated it. Honor your father and your mother, so that your days may be long in the land that the Lord your God is giving you. You shall not murder. You shall not commit adultery. You shall not steal. You shall not bear false witness against your neighbor. You shall not covet your neighbor's house. You shall not covet your neighbor's wife, or male or female slave, or ox or donkey, or anything that belongs to your neighbor. A reading from 1 Corinthians. The message about the cross is foolishness to those who are perishing, but to us who are being saved, it is the power of God. For it is written, I will destroy the wisdom of the wise, and the discernment of the discerning I will thwart. Where is the one who is wise? Where is the scribe? Where is the debater of this age? Has not God made foolish the wisdom of the world? For since in the wisdom of God the world did not know God through wisdom, God decided, through the foolishness of our proclamation, to save those who believe. 
For Jews demand signs and Greeks desire wisdom, but we proclaim Christ crucified, a stumbling block to Jews and foolishness to Gentiles. But to those who are the called, both Jews and Greeks, Christ, the power of God and the wisdom of God. For God's foolishness is wiser than human wisdom, and God's weakness is stronger than human strength. Gospel according to John. The Passover of the Jews was near, and Jesus went up to Jerusalem. In the temple he found people selling cattle, sheep, and doves, and the money changers seated at their tables. Making a whip of cords, he drove all of them out of the temple, both the sheep and the cattle. He also poured out the coins of the money changers and overturned their tables. He told those who were selling the doves, Take these things out of here. Stop making my father's house a marketplace. His disciples remembered that it was written, Zeal for your house will consume me. The Jews then said to him, What sign can you show us for doing this? Jesus answered them, Destroy this temple, and in three days I will raise it up. The Jews then said, This temple has been under construction for forty-six years, and will you raise it up in three days? But he was speaking of the temple of his body. After he was raised from the dead, his disciples remembered that he had said this, and they believed the scripture and the word that Jesus had spoken. Dear friends of Christ, grace to you and peace from God our Father, from our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Oh, man, maybe I could have entitled uh, this sermon, Can We Talk? Because I just want to talk to you this morning. I want to tell you, do you remember my old story about the, the little monk from Canada? Real shy. The, the one thing he never wanted to do in the monastery was ever have to preach a chapel. And one day the abbot came to him and he said, you're preaching tomorrow. 
And he was in mortal, mortal terror. You know, a lot of people have fear of public speaking. And he just, he said, the Abbot, I'll do anything. I'll do all the menial tasks, all the jobs around the monastery. I just don't want to preach. And the Abbot said, you have to challenge yourself. You're preaching tomorrow. So when chapel started, the little monk stood up in front of his brothers and the other monks. And he said, do you know what I'm going to say? And they all said, no. And he said, neither do I. Receive the benediction. Go in peace. The abbot was apoplectic. Yeah, he's blood vessels showing up in his neck, you know. He was so upset. He went to the little monk and he said, that was horrible. He said, tomorrow you're going to preach again. No, Abbot, I can't preach. I just can't public speak. I, I just can't do it. But the next day, come chapel, come time for the homily. The little monk got up and he said, uh, looked at all his brothers and all the other monks, and he said, uh, you know what I'm going to say? Well, now they've caught on, so they all said, yeah, yeah, we know what you're going to say. Well, the little monk said, in that case, I guess I don't have to say it. Receive the benediction <laughs> and go in peace. <laughs> well, now the, I mean, now the abbot was just absolutely out of his mind with rage. And he went to the little monk and he said, you're not going to get away with this. You're preaching again tomorrow. The little monk was in fear, of course, at the moment, but it came and chapel and it came time for the sermonette <laughs> and he got up and he looked at his brothers and he looked at the monks and he looked at the abbot and he said do you know what i'm going to say and some people went yeah and some people went no and he said well in that case well the people who know what i'm going to say please tell the people who don't know what i'm going to say receive the benediction and go and be this kind of wishy-washy preaching is about in the church you know what I'm going to say? No, of course you don't. But in some ways you should. Huh? As we base our messages always upon the Word of God. And in some cases, maybe we do have to have a few that know what I'm going to say, tell the ones who don't know what I'm going to say, right? Receive the benediction. Go in peace. You know, there's an old saying, it comes from a English theologian uh, and raconteur, I would say, responsible for writing the Father Brown Mysteries, for instance. His name was G.K. Chesterton. And he said, if you don't stand for something, you'll fall for anything. You know, we think we're pretty sophisticated in this day and age, don't we? Oh, we've arrived, 2015. We are the leading edge of civilization. You know, we're cosmopolitan and, and outward thinking, open-minded, huh? We have this kind of, we have the world by the tail. We, we really know things. And, and we're not subject to, you know, to any kind of gullibility. And of course, this has invaded a, the culture has invaded the church because a lot of people believe if it's not a scientific fact, it must be a faithful fantasy. Huh? When in fact the opposite is true. Science is as much fantasy and theory as perhaps we could say faith is. But we are in fact... <laughs> Last week I was hearing a lot of stories about all of the kind of scams that are going around. I mean, that must be an indication of a kind of gullibility that we want to deny in ourselves. The other day, I don't know what kind of scam it was, but the other day I, I stopped at a place to buy something out, out, off Golf Road where everybody apparently shops nowadays. And I came out of the store and a guy said, what'd you buy? I thought that was a little forward. So well, what'd you pay for it? I told him. I was going, you know, I think I'm pretty sophisticated, so you know, I'm gonna go along with him. Then I'm starting to think, what 
kind of scam is this, you know? And then he says, well, how much sales tax did you pay? And he reached into his pocket and he says, I'd like to refund sales tax to people. And I said, fine. I took it, got in my car, and drove away. Him standing there waiting to snap the scam. I don't know what it is. I heard last week about uh, now with tax season, you know, and don't fall for this one. They call you up and, I mean, it's not, can I help you with your computer? You know, they got an Indian accent and they're saying, I'm calling from the IRS, you owe this much money and I got the sheriff at your door. Are we really as sophisticated and cosmopolitan as we think we are? If you don't stand for something, you will fall for anything. And there, every day and every way we hear in the news about some new scam or some new thing that preys on our our inherent, let's give ourselves some credit, our inherent trust, the, the trust we place in human nature. Can, is that trust well placed? Let's look at the gospel text. <laughs> A text that has been much maligned in the mainstream church. Because here, let me analyze it to you. The story of the cleansing of the temple. I mean, there's hardly a main mainline pastor who wants to talk on this text. Why? Because you'll have to admit it shows you another side of Jesus. And of course we wouldn't want to talk about a Jesus who had the courage of his convictions. Because we're living in a culture, as a young man told me the other day, we just want everybody to feel included. The problem with that is what price do you pay for including everybody? Do you just accept, you know, accept the crazy notions that are about in the world in the, all in the interest of including everybody? Apparently Jesus didn't feel that way. He went into the temple and he saw that it had been turned, huh? into, into a, a marketplace. And having the courage of his convictions and knowing the real purpose for which the temple stood, he overturned the money changers' tables. You know, I've heard for years, 40 years of ministry, heard, you know, and this is how some people think this text functions, you know, just to say, well, we don't want no money changers in the temple. But is it really so much about that as it is about encouraging us to stand tall? When I was a kid, I grew up in the fifth. I grew up in the fifties, right after World War II. And you remember that, some of you. What we called the Red Scare. And regularly. On TV, we would see ads that would say, stand up and be counted in the fight against communism. Huh? Nobody thought that was odd. Nobody thought that was strange to invite people to have the courage of their convictions, to stand tall and proud for what they believe. And yet it seems nowadays that that this attitude, that we, we just sweep aside those stories about Jesus that, 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 that we don't like, that don't seem to fit into our modern sensibilities. That Jesus would actually become angry about this situation. And somebody wrote a book a few years ago called The Jesus I Never Knew, and they were right. <laughs> they never knew Jesus. And they talked about how when they grew up in a little congregation in North Dakota and their Sunday school teacher while she was well-meaning told all these stories about Jesus and this has become you know this has become common practice for people to reject the basic and fundamental stories that that that, that form the foundation of our faith you bet he never knew Jesus I I like the story about the uh, woman and her husband were standing and they were watching their neighbors, another couple, and, 
and he was embracing his wife and giving her a kiss and and the woman turned and upbraided her husband and said well you know she said they are so devoted to each other he kisses her every time they they meet why don't you do that and the husband said well i don't know her that well <laughs> I, <laughs> how well do we know Jesus? Do we know Jesus well enough to accept the fact that sometimes he too got angry and outraged about what, where do we draw the line? And as a congregation, we have decided to draw the line here, right? We've talked about this many times, that in fact the Holy Scriptures are God's Word. We've drawn the line at the fact that Jesus Christ bodily died and rose again. That he truly is the Son of God. These are the things that we have drawn the line at. And we will not let some mealy-mouthed, wishy-washy person say to us, Do you know what I'm about to say? Because why don't the people who do know tell the people who don't know? And receive the benediction and go your way. That's our favorite part of the service, by the way, the benediction, right? But if you don't stand for something, you'll fall for anything. And it's still as true now as it, as it ever was. And for us as Christians, we need to know, we need to be proud and clear about our core convictions, our basic values, our understanding. You know, we don't fool around with the language. We talk about sin. We talk about repentance. We talk about forgiveness. We talk about salvation. We talk about, heaven help us, the conversion that people actually will hear the word and have their lives changed. Now witness Mark and Peggy coming to us to tell us how lives have changed in West Africa because of their work and, the, and Peggy, that was just so great, the way you talked about how you spoke to God. I've spoken to God in the same way, and he said, you know, I am working, but I'm doing it through you. And that's what we've learned as a saving grace congregation, that God, if we sit still long enough and don't have so many tall opinions about what God can do and where he can do it and why, why he can do it, that God will work through each of us. You see? And to stand proud and tall for what we believe. Because if you don't stand for something, you'll fall for anything, you see. There was a big conflict in a congregation, and the pastor thought he was going to resolve it, so he had one group over here and the other group over here, and he had a spokesman from each group, and the first... The first spokesman got up and said, well, this is what we're upset about, and this is what we, and explained the whole position that they had and got done, and the pastor looked at the spokesman and said, I think you're right. The other spokesman spoke for the other group and explained why they disagreed with the first group and where their position was and why they were upset and all of the rest of it, and, and the spokesman got done, and the pastor said, you know, I think you're right, too. And the first spokesman said, we can't both be right. And the pastor said, you know, you're right. <laughs> because this is what we believe as Christians. That you can't be right and I can't be right if God is right. If God is righteous, then I'm not as right as I think. And you, do you know what I'm about to say? <laughs> you don't even dare shake your head because <laughs> you know the benediction is coming <laughs> and I know each and every one of you in this room and I know that you have the courage of your convictions be proud of those convictions share those convictions who knows but that word that you share will be like unto the word that share, shared through Teamwork Africa and then it will change a life not just in Africa, but it will change your life. Speak proudly of a Lord who could get angry enough to cleanse the temple because he encourages us to 
cleanse our own lives and to cleanse the lives of others. See? Do you know what I'm going to say? If you don't stand for something, you'll fall for anything. Amen. The peace of God which passes all understanding, keep your hearts and minds through Christ Jesus. Amen. Amen.